I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Dr. Effie Polarinu, a globally recognized thought leader in the fintech industry and in the advanced technologies that are shaping our economies and societies. Effie is a mathematician with an MBA and a PhD in finance from the University of Tennessee and decades of experience across Wall Street and academia in North America. She's a published author and a passionate content creator focused on innovation. Effie is trusted by global brands, including Microsoft, NVIDIA, Oracle, Hawaii, and innovators in financial services like Global RegTech Comply Advantage, Singaporean Wealth Tech, ADDX, Swiss Crypto Bank, Siba Bank, and many others. She's also a faculty member of the new Fast Future Executive Team, talking about the future of finance and money. Effie is the recipient of numerous honors, such as being Refinitiv's number one global woman influencer in finance and data conversation, included as a thought letter by on thought leader by On Analytica in FinTech and AI, a top digital futurist, a LinkedIn and Twitter voice by Ingatica, and amongst the top 100 technology influencers by the Awards Magazine. She joins us today to discuss the current state of the fintech industry and provide insights into the future of money and finance. So Effie, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today. I want to start out by saying that we're in the middle of a crypto winter and we've got three bank failures here in the US, but the fintech industry overall seems to be moving forward regardless. What are some of the most exciting trends going on in this sector right now? First of all, thank you, Tim, for, for having me. And, and uh, um, it's it's an honor to be at this moment that is really a very special moment in our industry, financial services. I would say, as you already mentioned, um, we have the crypto winter. We have uh, the issue with um, three very particular banks, the, the banks that... Um, were uh, that failed um, are uh, important in in many different ways that I'd like uh, to discuss. Uh, what is clear is that the digitalization of financial services is unstoppable, and and nothing will will stop it. Um, it it may take twists and turns. It may get uh, stopped by regulations. And, and we all know that the world in some funny way doesn't change in the sense that regulations vary by jurisdiction. And, you know, um, there's all these non-standard, non-harmonized issues. And, and because money and finance is digital and the economies are, are globalized, all these affect in very complex ways. So I would say, you know, that um, innovation is continuing. And, and what is exciting is that the minute something happens in one region, you realize that another region is progressing in a different way because each region has its own issues, right? Um, so in the developed world, we face certain issues and in, in developing countries, we see much more impact, I would say, uh, from, from innovation simply because uh, they, they were behind in terms of the maturity of the financial services, the maturity of the economies. Uh, I would say that if you look at payments, for example, payments remain core in any economy, no matter how advanced uh, and digitalized and, and super duper technologically it is, that does not change. So just looking at what's going on in payments that are actually pretty complex, you would think that payments are basic, maybe boring and so on, but they are pretty complex both for individuals and, and businesses, and especially in this world where um, we we are digitalizing you know commerce mostly but not only we have uh, we're trying to digitalize supply chains digitalize logistics so it's it's a very um 
complex picture of, of innovations that are happening and they are affecting finance and finance is affecting the other sectors. You know, mm. think of smart cities, think of, of logistics in smart ports. And in general, if we think of um, our traumatized supply chains from the, the oh, pandemic, yeah. that gives us a good picture of, you know, how the issues of, of finance and money are intertwined and how can we make data flow and so on. And so, so when I think of fintech innovation, there's all these issues. Crypto are part of fintech. That's yeah. how I like to think uh, of, of crypto, a more, um, a less mature, if you want, uh, part and, and, and a part that is uh, finding a lot of uh, friction from, from regulations, but not only because it's, it's a power game. It's also making us rethink the idea of money. What is money? Is, can we remain stuck with the idea that money is the traditional definition of a medium of exchange, a unit of account and a store of value? Maybe not. Uh, maybe we're moving in a world where we can differentiate these. So there's all these exciting things uh, going on um, that are, are complex and all the technologies that are advanced technologies and shaping the fourth industrial revolution like artificial intelligence and blockchain, they are at the core of fintech in many ways, we're not even close to combining them. Imagine there the possibilities. So I'll stop there. <laughs> oh, yeah, you know, absolutely. There is so much change happening. And I've been reading through your blog on Medium, and I will put a link into the show notes for that as well. And one of the things that surprised me was when I think of fintech, I tend to think of crypto and blockchain. But as you've said, it's transforming the entire industry. And on your blog, you were writing about, you're writing about banks, you're writing about Amex and Visa, you're writing about very traditional financial institutions, right? And and that was one of the things that kind of surprised me because I said, you know, technology, it's not just blockchain anymore. That it, it, It's more of an idea of change. And I think distributed trust is, is definitely a big part of that. And it seems like it is changing the entire industry along with it. Is is that kind of where things are at right now? It is. It is. And and what's happened is in the first phase, if you want, the fintech startups, even before blockchain, fintech startups that were using cloud native services or were using alternative data and AI to evaluate uh, credit decisions, you know, giving a, a loan, um, credit scores, and so on. So all these were fintech. Fintech was and it is peer-to-peer -peer payment payments. Or you know, in Africa we have mobile money, which is you don't have a bank account, but you can do all the banking services that you want, be it payments, be it loans, be it anything, both as an individual and as a business, and you do it through a SIM card on your phone, no bank account. So, so there's innovations that are all fintech beyond uh, uh, blockchain, and then you have blockchain and um, that's coming and in, in sort of disrupting the notion that we need uh, centralized entities to yeah. perform um, the banking um, uh, processes that, that we all uh, need. And in the beginning, there was all these disruptors, there was going to be a war and who was going to win and so on. And that changed slowly uh, in, in many ways. In some ways it changed and there's partnerships. Some of the big entities, like you mentioned, the big credit card networks like MasterCard and Visa, they have been um, innovating in, in many ways, either through partnerships, either uh, through um, uh, acquisitions, uh, but also transforming their own business models. 
Uh, Visa and MasterCard, for example, are very much helping the industry uh, with with, um, blockchain rails where they can move around money like stable coins, like um, um, uh, the circle stable coin that's pegged to, to the dollar. So there's bridges being built with the innovators and some, of course, banks. Um, JP Morgan is a very aggressive player in the digitalization, in the fintech uh, space in in many different uh, ways. And particularly them, I consider them very aggressive in blockchain. They've been involved both in building infrastructure and in all the pilots that you see across the world from from Singapore to Europe with central banks looking at how you can move either money on these new rails or even securities like stocks and bonds and so on. So so we live in a world that um, is is mixed. At the same time, of course, there are banking entities that are are behind very much. Well, and it does, it seems like everything is maturing. And one of the things that I wanted to ask about was stable coins. You mentioned these a moment ago. The one that I am most familiar with is Tether, right? And and that's that's something that people have used on the exchanges, but um, there are several of them out there. And I'm wondering, do you think that stable coins may end up being used for transactions? Because it seems like the volatility of things like Bitcoin or even Ethereum, right, where they go up and down in value, it seems like that adds a lot of complexity to kind of the daily transaction cycle, you know? And like, if you go to, I'm just thinking of buying something online with Bitcoin, there are companies that accept Bitcoin, right, you know, for purchases. But I think one of the challenges is, as someone buying or as the company receiving it, um, you know, if you're charging a dollar for something and the value changes, you may end up receiving payment that is, you know, I mean, 10, 15 percent lower. Right. And, and so yeah. this this adds a lot of complexity. Do you think that something like a stable coin may help balance this out and could ultimately become kind of the, the medium of exchange for online transactions? Well, again, it depends on the region. You know, in the developed world, um, you know, stable coins like Tether uh, or or Circle, and I, I mentioned Circle, yeah. uh, although Tether is a much bigger one in market cap, uh, Circle is, is more regulated in the U.S. at least and, and therefore is perceived as, as less um, uh, risky in, in some way. Um, I would say that these private stable coins have served the purpose uh, of linking the traditional world with the crypto exchanges. Up until now, that's their main sort of um, reason uh, for for being around. However, when we look at emerging markets um, like Africa and some Asian markets that are plagued, or even in Latin America, um, that are plagued by inflation of their local currencies, and that there is a shortage of of U.S. dollars that traditionally has been for them um, a savior and a store of value, and so on. Uh, In a lot of these countries, they want to hold the Bitcoins uh, or or those types of um, uh, uh, cryptocurrencies for many reasons. One, for self-sovereignty, so they can keep something that can't be confiscated or or held by the government or or the banks and that can be transacted fast and freely uh, across cross border and for them that makes much more uh, sense and i know even in africa bitcoin is used to transact with transparency and then at both ends it's so easy to to convert it to whatever you want to convert it if it is available. On the other hand, Tim, we must mention that these private stable coins like Tether and so on, um, in a way are competing with the central bank digital currencies that in some countries are a concept that is discussed, it's researched in other countries, 
there is a more advanced, they are more in a pilot phase. We know already we have, I think now we have nine countries that actually have a central bank digital currency. The biggest country is China with the digital one, but we have Nigeria in, in Africa, the central bank has issued one. And in the Caribbean, we have a couple of them. And of course, they're in the phase of seeing how they're going to be adopted by the economy, the retailer and the businesses, it's early to say. But if you look at the world, I can see over the next five years, at least, that we'll have a mix of everything of the currencies that we know. Uh, we might have some private stable coins that are used for certain purposes, but we might have some central bank digital currencies and we might have some, some crypto too for other uh, reasons. Again, it depends. What's the value of self-sovereignty? It depends the country that you're living in, right? Yeah. Well, so I, I want to go back. I want to rewind a little bit to, I guess, one of the underlying ideals. Um, one of the fundamental ideas behind Bitcoin, Ethereum, blockchain, and cryptocurrencies in general is this idea of distributed trust. And my impression has been, and this goes back to kind of the, the beginning of it, that it seemed like this picked up a lot of steam because of a loss of faith in traditional financial institutions and centralized banking after the 2008 financial crisis. Do you still think that this plays a role in determining the future of finance? It does play a role. It does play a role because as you said, it, uh, it started in 2008. There's still, you know, the question, was it a coincidence or not? But um, we can understand that the narrative that it represented really aligned with the crisis and with what followed after the crisis, which was all the printing of money uh, that happened that yes. devalues um, the currency. All that aligns with the fact that primarily Bitcoin that was um, uh, launched uh, back in in. The 2008 crisis, Ethereum came much later in 2014. And in any case, Ethereum is not based on um, the scarcity of a, of a fixed supply. It has a, a totally different purpose and, and structure. But the, the idea that of self-sovereignty, of not being able to change the supply of money with the advantages and disadvantages of it is definitely in alignment um, uh, with that. And even now with the crisis of, of the um, uh, three banks failing, we see this reaction in the market of, um, you know, maybe we, we Bitcoin is some type of uh, diversification, but that's a whole other discussion. Uh, it's like having the discussion about gold and, you know, is it a commodity and, 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 and so on. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you know, the, the three banks that are failing, the one I've been reading about is Silicon Valley Bank, right? And th that is a, a very separate discussion. But you know, in the in the crypto space, crypto exchanges seem to be the weak link. And you know, it, we we recently had the FTX exchange that went down. Um, there have been exchanges before that, and every time that happens, there are lots and lots of calls for heavy government regulation of these. Um, so far, regulation remains light, right? Should that change? Well, first of all, the, the, the collapse of uh, FTX clearly was um, uh, a result of fraud and very, the lack of governance. I wouldn't say bad governance, the lack of governance. Um, the, the shutdown of, of the U.S. banks has nothing to do with fraud, uh, there are clearly issues around uh, bad risk management of the, the portfolio, but th th that's uh, of different nature. With regards to regulation of the crypto entities, I would say that in the US, sadly, there has been lack of clarity of regulation. It's not that there isn't regulation, 
there is lack of clarity of, of regulation that has really inhibited innovation and has pushed several entities to move away from the US and come to jurisdictions that are more crypto friendly, not in the sense that they are the wild west, but that there is clarity, there has been clarity over time. Where I am based in Switzerland is a great example of a country and a jurisdiction that has been very clear with very, um, uh, how can I say, precise uh, 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 regulation around uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, we have uh, uh, three fully regulated new licensed uh, crypto banks here. We have uh, I think close to 20 financial entities here that are regulated and offer um, all sorts of financial services around asset management or pure custody or, or all the services that are needed for crypto entities. So I would say that in the US, we need that clarity. On the other hand, again, we're facing globally the challenge that there isn't harmonization in, in regulations, so how do you deal with that in in you know, with cryptocurrencies that don't have borders? There's no friction there. So how do you regulate that <laughs> if you're not harmonized? And and you know different jurisdictions have different regulations. It's 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 absurd. Uh, you it's not like the aeroplane can take another route and not move above that there of that uh, jurisdiction. So. We, we do have um, a, a problem in centralized exchanges or decentralized exchanges of crypto, unfortunately, um, have this uh, problem and issue. And uh, from what I understand in the US too, there's lobbying right now and, and the industry is trying to help policymakers to understand the issues and move towards clarity. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and so the exchanges are used, I mean, in part to, they, they set the value of Bitcoin, as I understand things, and of crypto. Um, in terms of actual transactions and, and like payment support, uh, one of the things that really intrigued me was seeing PayPal supporting Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum, and Litecoin. And it lets people convert those currencies into dollars for online purchases or into their, their native currency, whatever they're using on the platform. So one of the things I've heard many times in the past was that people saying a major provider like this needs to support crypto for it to start to really, truly gain market adoptance for transactions. Do you think that PayPal, and I know others are not far behind it, do you think that this is what it will take to kind of start to push it into the mainstream? Well, I mean, that's that's one way. PayPal is one entity. The, the card networks uh, uh, are other entities. Uh, we know that Facebook tried to uh, launch their own um, stablecoin Libra. They, they ran into regulatory issues. So definitely, if one of the these big players facilitate um, uh, the usage, uh, it, it's definitely going to, to help uh, uh, adoption. I would say that the, these players are um, helping also people get familiar with what is a wallet and a, a wallet for crypto, because we all have wallets, you know, on our phones, be it the Apple Pay wallet or the Google wallet or, or so on, but that, but that is, uh, different. Um, uh, what, how does a wallet that holds crypto behave? It's like you're getting familiar with the, the software and the interfaces. The truth is that the user experience of a lot of the apps or dApps in the crypto space is not that easy to, to use. Yeah. And it needs it, it, it's, it's time, let alone we have a lot of security issues at the point of entry, which is a traditional entry, but you know the space needs its time, and and it will it will evolve. And while we're talking, you know, all this is within Web two. In parallel, we have Web three coming in, 
uh, in different forms uh, with the metaverse. Um, we have non-fungible tokens yeah. and so on. So, so there's a lot parallel moves. Some are going faster. Some find, uh, you know, friction because of regulation, because of cybersecurity issues and so on. So there's, there's a lot of exciting new things and we, we have to to watch and see at what speed they will be adopted and what form they will take. It, it is interesting. So with NFTs or non-fungible tokens, one of the things that I've seen there is this idea that you could take online art, right? And help to value that as well as preserve ownership of that by converting it into an NFT. And another concept that's really intriguing is decentralized autonomous organizations which are basically entity structures in which token holders participate in management and decision-making without there being any kind of central authority. Um, so these seem like, these are outside of the traditional crypto space, right? Uh, they're, they're in blockchain, but um, you know, it seems like this is, it's starting to, I, I guess, um, mature again as an industry, right? We're, we're starting to see different variations of this idea of blockchain. Do you uh, do you put any faith in these two taking off? Well, I mean, non fungible tokens clearly uh, are something that um, is very important. And yes, it it took off mostly uh, by tokenizing digital art uh, and and having the the famous collections um, of. Uh, uh, crypto punks and, and ape uh, the ape club and so on that was used uh, mainly as uh, images uh, profile images on on Twitter. What's interesting there to to observe is that here we have the the interaction of culture, art, and technology in in um, sort of a, a feedback loop. Uh, so, so we we took digital art and we found a way um, to tokenize it and basically uh, democratize access and and offer to the creators um, much more power in terms of yeah. them getting you know their uh, royalties and, and so on. So this is a very important. Um, cultural uh, and societal advancement in terms of the uh, we're, we're going into an internet which it's not the platform the central platform that has most of the games so that there i think that is a, a noteworthy importance of the the way that um, non-fungible tokens were used or are used for digital art on the other hand there's many other more, even more important and potentially uh, impactful cases where we could imagine that our digital identities can be non-fungible tokens. Mm, and when we talk okay. about our digital identities, I'm not talking about, uh, you know, tokenizing your driver's license in the U.S., which is an ID or a passport uh, 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 like that. But I'm talking about the aspects of my identity and your identity, which are multiple, it's it, our identity has a date of date of birth. It may contain, you know, where we were born. It may contain where we live, our education, all sorts of things. That's part of our identity. If we can tokenize those parts and be able to hold them ourselves, self-sovereign. Right, so they're not lying around for theft and so on, and we don't have to disclose them. We we only disclose the part that is needed uh, uh, every okay. time. That's extremely important. So there, I see a huge potential, and and I know that there are a lot of efforts of using the non fungible tokens for that purposes, and that will have a huge impact on the future of the internet, be it web. Three, three and a half, whatever you 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 want to call it, in our digital life that is continuing, whether it go to the metaverse or or whatever. So so that I think is is extremely important, um, and I'm very excited about that. 
and and uh, uh, keeping an eye on on the developments in in the space. Uh, and and we're seeing all sorts of experiments on non fungible tokens. You know, Nike, for example, has all these collectibles of of digital sneakers, and and they're, they're creating a huge marketplace. Starbucks recently um, launched a, a, a collection of of uh, um, collectibles. They are really you can't even see that that you don't even need to know anything about uh, non fungible tokens but you you get this digital pass to to special um experiences if you ah. want. so so i um, you know digital experiences digital identity digital ownership in many ways it's very important and with respect to the daos the the decentralized autonomous organizations that's another exciting part i would say that it is progressing slowly but it has a lot of potential and in my mind i see it as a digital analog of um, um of uh, i would say um what is it not communities um like, like it, a corporate charter maybe that's that's kind um, of yeah, oh, corporate charter. I'm trying to think the word, and it escapes uh, uh, my 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 mind right now. Where you know the ownership it belongs to to actually the users. Um, mm. uh, for example, uh, uh, the the word will come to me. But it, it, the idea is that we can start implementing DAOs for public goods. You know, uh, there we we start to understand. Uh, its use versus thinking how can we move away from corporations and shareholders and traditional um, structures like that. But if we think of how can we handle uh, public goods like, you know, I don't know, the, the public square and what to do about it, who does it belong, how are we going to organize its use and, and so on. There we understand that there's a need uh, uh, for collaboration. And I think it's also in alignment with this idea of um, the next level of democracy is more participatory than what we have right now. Instead yeah. of sending delegates, be it in the political arena or, you know, um, in, in a corporate structure, right? we are participating more directly. And it's a question of degree, right? Decentralization and participation, it, it doesn't, it's not black and white. You're either, you know, you do nothing or a hundred percent, but to move away from just delegating. And in some cases we do choose to delegate, but we should be able to have the option to participate more and to find ways to, to be closer with people for issues that we care. So you and I could be in a DAO or a couple of DAOs because we care about the same things and participate in those DAOs. So that's the world that we see that the technology is enabling and there's a value alignment there, but it's difficult to, to, to change. That's how yeah. I see. it is. It, all of this is so amazing. So. Epi, I know that you are running a little bit tight on schedule. The one thing that I absolutely have to ask about is our big wild card, artificial intelligence. And mm. I think chat GPT, right, has just sent shockwaves across the tech landscape. Uh, chat GPT 3.5 was the one making all the headlines. They are just coming out with chat GPT 4.0. And I think what that says is artificial intelligence is, is bigger and better and it's arriving sooner than at least myself expected, I think more than most of us expected. How do you see AI impacting uh, the, the DeFi community? You know, AI, clearly it's it's a hot uh, topic and, and chat uh, GPT really gave us, um, uh, gave the masses, if you want, a taste of, of the capabilities. I think yeah. that's, that's the big difference because honestly, there is a lot 
going on that is wow in terms of artificial intelligence, but it's at the level that you and I in everyday life cannot, you know, comprehend because it's not in our everyday life, personal or or business life. But here we got a taste of of the leap that is uh, that is happening, and of course of the uh, issues, the ethical issues that we have to to decide on. Um, and I mean, for me, the first is that uh, again we we are moving so fast that it's a bit a shock to our nervous system, <laughs> if you want, how to adapt to this world. We have mixed feelings of, okay, what does it mean for our jobs and 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 how are we going to use it and so on. The, I mean, in, in financial services, it is clear that AI will have a huge impact starting from conversational AI that can facilitate uh, a lot of things at scale in financial services. And then of course, in securities, in trading, in, in investing and, and so on. Um, I think it's important um, to, to keep in mind that um, AI is not a threat to our jobs, but the people that will teach themselves to leverage AI, right? Those are the ones that will take our jobs if we stay behind. So to me, the, the message that I would like to close and, uh, and leave everybody is, you know, it's in our hands and it's our responsibility to train ourselves how to use these tools uh, for whatever we, we are doing for work and and, and and empower ourselves because that's the way that um, we have to move forwards. And those that just sit there and, and do not try and use, and you have to experiment. Uh, the invitation is an invitation to experiment and, and see how to use it. For example, in chat GPT, you experiment with asking questions. The yeah. better you become in prompts, you know, you can become an, an AI prompt uh, engineer or, or person. It, it is very true, depending on how you want to, to use it. Um, and and that's, that, that's uh, the reality. So uh, stop resisting, stop being, you know, um, stuck because of fear and because of uncertainty, experiment, enjoy and see how to use these tools in whatever context um, one, one, you know, is interested. Wonderful. Epi, thank you so much for your time today. It has truly been a pleasure having you with me and an honor to have your insights on this. Let me close by asking, um, what comes next for you? What are you engaged in and what are you looking forward to throughout this year? I mean, I'm very excited. I continue to be excited uh, with the interconnectedness of all these uh, innovations. And, and this, um, uh, again, uncertain way, uh, in, in some cases, delightful way, how they uh, overlap, converge, and unlock uh, value. And, and in some cases, it's a dangerous way yeah that, that um, it, it can happen. So that's where I'm excited. I'm excited again to see that, you know, I'm focused in finance. This is where I'm coming from. I'm looking at innovations there, but there's nothing that's in a silo. So finance is changing commerce and retail. It's changing transportation. It's changing mobility. It's changing healthcare. So it's kind of, a very fascinating uh, world and, and watching uh, what gets adopted, what is what are the most successful use cases uh, because the technology comes around and it's us people that you know determine in the end with regulations what will be the most uh, successful. So there's a lot of exciting things. And, and of course, 
I'm also very um, aware and watchful and, and thinking um, all the geopolitical complexities in our world that of course are affecting uh, the speed uh, of, of, of these um, innovations and how they impact our societies. So everything's connected, social, technology, uh, everything. Wonderful. Ify, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Tim. It was a pleasure.